All right. Awesome. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. McCoy. She joins us from the Department of Rheumatology. She trained at Case, Ann Arbor, and Mayo. Um, she has several active grants studying Sjogren's Syndrome patients and SSA antibodies and is very well published. Um, she has presented both locally and nationally on Sjogren's Syndrome and is here today to discuss the OBGYN manifestations of this disorder. So without further ado, Dr. McCoy. Hey, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I'm really grateful for everybody inviting me today to talk uh, because clearly this is an area of interest I have and it spans multiple specialties including ob -GYN. and so for me to have the opportunity to present here uh, feels good because it's I think an under-recognized disease and I appreciate your time um, in staying here with me uh, to discuss this. So I'll be talking about Sjogren's Syndrome uh, which is my disease of interest. Um, my disclosures. Uh, so I figured I'd start off with the first part of the talk discussing Sjogren syndrome in general, just so that we're all on the same page and background and understanding of the disease. And then I'll move on to gynecologic and obstetric manifestations um, with what I believe is a review of the literature to the extent that we know today, um, with much room for growth. So the goal of the first part is so that you become familiar with the epidemiology and the pathogenesis of the disease, because I think you'll find the epidemiology is impactful to how you will practice. And then also to discuss um, recognition and management of gynecologic uh, manifestations of the disease, as well as to talk about the obstetric manifestations and, and how that's managed currently. And I was given the opportunity to discuss this with the MFM uh, folks earlier in the year, and I actually didn't get to this part of the talk, so um, I'm happy to have the opportunity to discuss it today. All right, so generally, what is our Sjogren's syndrome patient, what does our Sjogren's syndrome patient look like? Um, well, they have severe ocular and oral dryness due to chronic inflammation. And as a reminder, because it may have been a little while for you, when we talk about dryness of the eyes and mouth, we're talking about the lacrimal gland living at the outer third of the eye, and we're talking about the salivary glands. And we have major salivary glands. You'll see why this is relevant in a bit. And these are the big ones that live in front of your ear, under your tongue, and in your neck. And you have a pair of each. In addition, you have minor salivary glands. And if you run your tongue along your lip, you'll feel these little bumps. You have about a thousand of them. And those little glands are responsible for making your basal saliva. So it allows you to speak. And we think, we suspicion that that's what provides the bacteriostatic properties of your saliva. So that's why you don't get cavities, even though our mouths are really germy. Um, so the other term that I think is important to establish is this primary versus secondary. You may see us throwing it around in our notes. Um, I know I refer my patients to MFM frequently. Um, and we'll throw in the term primary or secondary Sjogren's syndrome. Um, and this is actually falling out of favor. So primary Sjogren's syndrome means they just have Sjogren's syndrome alone. And that's enough. Secondary refers to Sjogren's syndrome overlapping with something else. And typically rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or something along those lines. And so the term secondary is falling out of favor because it makes it sound like Sjogren's is less important. And the people in Sjogren's world don't think that that's true. And so we're moving towards overlap. And that, there's clearly bias to that, right? So history of the disease, and this is a fun one. So in 1888, Dr. Haddon first described an unfortunate female who was 65 year old, years old. She was Caucasian, and she had a severe dry mouth. Her tongue was dry and cracked like, like crocodile skin, and she couldn't swallow. She couldn't cry, which all of my patients cannot cry. And she was treated with pilocarpine at that time in 1888. Do you know what our, one of our primary treatments right now for Sjogren's is? Pilocarpine. <laughs> so that's unchanged in over a century. Uh, and he was the first person to use xerostomia. But Sjogren's wasn't coined at this point. That same year, Doc, Dr. Mukowitz, has anybody heard of Mukowitz disease or syndrome? He was the one who coined this, and it's something we discuss a lot. This farmer, who's pictured here in this photo, had painless salivary gland swelling. Um, of his uh, sublingual, submandibular, and um, lacrimal glands. And he actually died a year later of peritonitis. And so they were able to look at his glands and see that there was an intense inflammatory infiltrate. And this is this thing called Mukowitz syndrome. Um, it used to be thought a characteristic of Sjogren's, but now we know tuberculosis and lymphoma can cause a symmetric swelling. Um, finally, in 1933, 
Dr. Sjogren described the first case series of patients who had Sjogren's, many of whom had rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis as well. Um, his wife was an ophthalmologist, and she's barely mentioned in the literature, which is not a huge surprise, um, but she was, was, I think, pivotal in, in describing these patients as well. So here's the trick with Sjogren's syndrome, and this probably you'll come across too with things like vaginal dryness, is that it is very common to have dryness, extremely common. So up to 7% of the population experience dry eye, and 20% of the population have dry mouth at some point. So how do you tease out Sjogren's syndrome in a clinic from dryness? And that is the trick, and we'll, that's why we'll spend time talking about how we define Sjogren's syndrome compared to other diseases. Other epidemiologic phenomena that are unique to Sjogren's are the marked female predominance. So this is the most female predominant autoimmune disease. It has a ratio of 20 to 1, female to male. Um, the lowest ratio is 10 to 1, but against all of our other autoimmune diseases, even non-rheumatologic, female predominant autoimmune diseases, this is the most predominant. So the incidence and prevalence studies, I think, are misleading, and most rheumatologists think that they're misleading. Um, so the closest to our population, this was done in Olmstead County with the Mayo cohort, and it showed an incidence and prevalence that are pretty low. Um, but most rheumatologists believe that it's underreported um, because patients who have dry mouth just go to their dentist, who have dry eyes just go to their ophthalmologist, and in vaginal dryness just go to their gynecologist. So nobody really ties it together and says, let's check Sjogren's because most of these patients have dryness as their primary primary manifestation. And so most rheumatologists throw the prevalence of this around 1%, right under the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis, with how often we see it in clinic in our population. And that's what you'll see quoted in the literature a lot, although there aren't strong data, and our prevalence data are all over the place. I mean, the, the prevalence range is, is very broad. As you can see here, because the few studies done on elderly population say the prevalence is from 5 to 14% which is a huge jump from, from uh, the general prevalence that was reported recently. So you can see we have challenges in Sjogren's, um, but this is the best estimate we have to present to you today. So what's happening in this disease? So if this is a representative gland, we have players from the innate and adaptive immune system here. And what you see in the top is I drew in little epithelial cells and then a little toll-like receptor. And we think, like most autoimmune diseases, that Sjogren's syndrome is driven by both um, genetic and environmental factors. And the environmental factor we have implicated is viral infection. And one of those happens to be hepatitis C, which naturally has a tropism for salivary glands anyway. And the suspicion is something like a viral infection might trigger an innate immune response, and a troll-like receptor gets activated. And the epithelial cells in Sjogren's, <coughs> pardon me, can actually, whoops, can actually act as antigen-presenting cells. So the epithelial cells, once activated, can directly interact with T cells, activate T cells, and then we get the typical inflammatory milieu of cytokines. Oh, this isn't going to work on my misshapen ears here. Okay. Sorry. Oh, technique. Thanks. Thank you. We'll see. I just can't tilt my head and cough again. OK. <laughs> Be a challenge. All right. Um, so, you know, the, once the T cells become activated, as we know, then we have B cell activation as well. And then this inflammatory cascade actually self perpetuates the problem because we have apoptosis in response of the epithelial cells. And has anybody heard of the anti SSA antibody we look for? Yeah, because you look for that too. Oh, I can't. I'm going to. Okay. Can never give a TED talk. That's Okay, I, I got it again. We'll just not move. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, so uh, we, we, this apoptosis, so we know anti SSA. Yeah, thank you. Okay, like most things. Okay. <laughs> um, so, thank you. Um, so we know the anti-SSA antibody, or Rho, the same antibody, just different names, and I'll use them interchangeably, live inside this cell. 
And so the only way we think that they're revealed um, so that your, your, your humoral um, adaptive immune system can recognize them is if there's apoptosis. And that's something we see in histopathology on the salivary glands, our apoptosis. And so we think that this is a self-perpetuating cycle um, leading to adaptive immune system activation. There are also studies identifying genetic links. Um, so in, in uh, the large... In a large GWAS study, we have um, different genes identified and implicated in Sjogren's syndrome. And these make sense, uh, genes associated with innate immune system activation, T and B cell activation. And there are HLA associations, just like we see with many of our other autoimmune diseases. So what does this lead to? So this is our histopathology. On the left-hand side, you see a normal gland. There's no inflammation. Um, and on the right-hand side, what you see are these, these little uh, foci of lymphocytes, right? So you can see this dark purple spot from far away. And that's at least 50 lymphocytes in one foci. And around it, by definition, you have to have normal tissue. So in most patients, the tissue is actually normal other than these foci of inflammation. So that also leads us to ask, why are they dry then, if most of their gland is normal? We don't know. Um, so, so most of the gland is normal. They just have these foci of inflammation, and those are composed of mostly CD4-positive T cells. Um, in more severe disease, you can get B cell infiltrate and actually um, germinal-like centers in the glands themselves, so not where they belong. And this is an up-close um, picture. So... This is the part I find a little bit interesting about Sjogren's. We talked about the female to male ratio. It's predominantly female. The other interesting part that, again, we'll circle back to later in the talk because it has to do with you, is that we know autoantibodies in these patients form 18 to 20 years before diagnosis. So that's interesting because do you know what time period these autoantibodies are forming in? They're forming in the time period where patients have to get pregnant and have kids and whatnot but they don't clinically reveal their phenotype typically until around the time of menopause. So we suspicion there's something about estrogen or hormone withdrawal that allows for the onset of Sjogren's syndrome. So I actually did a study on this, and I'll again circle back to it later on. And this isn't perfect, but we had a cohort of over 1,000 Sjogren's patients and 1,000 control patients. Um, and within that cohort, we had patients fulfill a self-reported survey. And this is data we got kind of on the back end. But nobody had looked at an epidemiologic scale about hormone exposure and how it either protects or exacerbates the risk of Sjogren's. And so what we did is we created a composite score. And there are, we could debate about this. It's the end of the earth. But composite scores that we had a highly powered question to ask, which is estrogen protect protective or does it exacerbate Sjogren's? Does it have a role in Sjogren's pathogenesis? And so we created a composite score based on other studies that looked at uh, indicators or <coughs> um, other potential uh, markers of higher estrogen exposure, like early menarche, high parity. This is the most debatable one, so they include hysterectomy as a surrogate marker of high estrogen exposure. You can feed back to me about this. But the reasoning is because, the number one, Indication for hysterectomy is mineralogia or fibroids, and that tends to be seen with higher estrogen. So kind of a down-the-road surrogate marker, use of um, female hormone therapy or late menopause. And what we saw, so this is the composite score, kind of marking go, going down here from 0 to greater than or equal to 3. And you can see that the odds ratios of having Sjogren's drop in a dose-response relationship with the hormone exposure. And so, as you know, dose response indicates, a, helps us in these association studies determine that there's likely a causative relationship. So we would suspect that Sjogren's syndrome is, is protected by higher, is, patients are protected against Sjogren's syndrome by higher estrogen. And that goes in line with the, the time course of the disease where withdrawal of estrogen leads to onset of the clinical phenotype. And this is also reflected in mouse models. Um, but on a human scale, it's much harder to do. And so the next step with this is to do a longitudinal study. And we just submitted a grant to Marshfield to use their data set to try to do that. Um, so again, this dose-response relationship. So what does this lead to? So this is a patient of mine um, who is very good about dental hygiene. But you can see that she has 
very bad dental caries. And again, we discuss, we think these minor salivary glands are bacteriostatic, and these patients just don't have normal um, prevention of caries. Um, but they have severe oral and ocular, tracheal, vaginal, skin, and nose dryness. And when they come in, I check off which symptoms they have, and they usually have all of them. Sometimes they don't have you know, one or the other, but usually they'll have some sort of dryness. Um, but it's not just dryness. That's the trick with it, is it's actually an autoimmune disease, and our immune system is everywhere. And so it can affect many organ systems. So we can see an MS-like syndrome. We can have a CNS vasculitis. I see many patients who have interstitial lung disease um, and actually some profound um, abnormalities. Rarely does it progress to death, but uh, a fair amount of my cohort does. Um, they can get interstitial nephritis, glomerulonephritis. Arthrologists are very common, usually not erosive like RA, but in the same, it looks just like rheumatoid arthritis otherwise. Um, they can get autoimmune hepatitis, PBC. And this is the one most of my patients are concerned about. So my Sjogren's patients have a 15-fold increased risk of lymphoma, usually malt lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we think that that's just uh, due to immune system activation chronically. So this is a multi-system disease. And although they don't have an increased risk of mortality in the general population, you can see that certain subsets of Sjogren's patients do have an increased risk of mortality. And the most notable ones being a male already has a, has a two-fold increased risk, or twice the risk of uh, mortality as a, non, as a non-male um, Sjogren's patient, female, and uh, also just immune system activation in general. So we can see that patients who have vasculitis, which is, as you know, inflammation of the blood vessels leading to various manifestations, have a, a marked increased risk of uh, mortality, low complement, increased risk of mortality in cryos. So I do check cryos on most of my Sjogren's patients as a baseline. Um, so that I understand the risk of, of having complications down the road, and that's well studied. They also have reduction in quality of life. So this bar graph here, so we have the Sjogren's patients in black and the non-Sjogren's patients in white, and we see major indices of quality of life, like anxiety and depression, pain, usual activities, self-care, and mobility. And we see the Sjogren's is patients are much more effective than the average patient. And then we also see that they have health care costs twice the cost of control patients. Um, and it used to be before the era of biologics that they had uh, the same cost of health care as rheumatoid arthritis patients, but biologics have changed that game. Um, they have depression and fatigue. They have a marked increase in unemployment compared to the general population, so 8% versus 2%. They have increased sick days. Um, younger retirement, lower self-rated working prospect. So how do we diagnose this disease? So there are questions that are validated that we can ask in our clinic. And it actually takes around 45 seconds, maybe a minute, to ask these questions. So it doesn't take much time at all. And we don't just ask, do you have dry eye or dry mouth? Uh, because actually most patients will say yes. I see mainly 60-year-old females, and so they all have some dryness. But we have validated questions that help us determine if a patient has Sjogren's. And you'll see a theme through these questions demonstrating the chronicity and persistence of the disease on a daily basis. So the questions are, one, do you have a recurrent sensation of sand or gravel in your eyes when you wake up? Two, have you had a daily persistent troublesome dry eye for greater than three months? Three, do you use tear substitutes more than three times a day? And so these three questions really show the daily persistent nature of the disease, that it never remits. It's always a problem for the patient. It shouldn't wax and wane. <clears throat> we also ask, do you have dry mouth for more than three months? Do you have to drink liquids? To I say, do you have to take a sip of water to swallow a saltine? And it's just ticking down the questions. Um, the last one is the most specific. So most of these have sensory specificities around 80%. Um, but this question, have you had recurrent or persistent swollen salivary glands, has 98% specificity. So the vast majority of patients who endorse this likely will end up having Sjogren's. Um, I will say, I see a fair cohort of patients who say, oh yeah, I have, that I had swollen salivary glands when I was a teenager, and they kept telling me I had mumps. They didn't. Um, they ended up having Sjogren's, and it didn't reveal itself until they were 50 years down the road. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so how do we determine this in clinic? So most of these I actually do in a clinic visit. And these are a little more time intensive. So I perform an unstimulated whole salivary flow rate in my patients. I have them drool in a cup for five minutes. And I measure how much saliva they make. <laughs> and it's a long term, and everybody gets intimidated by that term. But it's really easy to do. I just have a Dixie cup and a scale. And then it's not too complicated. At the NIH, they have a, a fancy tube, but I just use a Dixie cup. And um, so what's neat about that is, right, one gram is equal to one milliliter of saliva. So I can easily convert that. Um, and we like to have a patient have more than 0.1 mils per minute. So if that's abnormal, then I do a stimulated salivary flow test, oops, which just entails them chewing on gauze. So it's really easy to do um, and can be some things that I can accomplish in clinic. Um, I also do Shermer's tests on my patients. So we just put a strip of paper in the corner of their eye. Um, and they really typically won't wet the strip, is what we see. It just stays bone dry. It's very uncomfortable. Um, a normal patient will wet the strip. Sjogren's, we usually co strongly consider the disease if there's less than five millimeters of wetting. So we just look at how far the wetness went down the strip. So these tests are really simple tests. Um, have been around for a long time. The problem, again, is that age confounds our disease, right? So people get dry with age. Um, and so the Shermers will become more abnormal with time. This is the one thing I can't do. Um, and this is where I rely heavily on ophthalmology. Um, so they can perform an ocular staining score. And essentially, all they do is they look at the amount of damage using various dyes of the cornea and conjunctiva, and then they give a scoring system. Um, and this is what I use when I don't get the answer in my in-clinic test. And it, and it has to be done by our cornea ophthalmologist. Um, it's very, it has to be well done because of the timing. So autoantibodies. So I have seen rheumatologists even saying that an ANA will screen and rule out for Sjogren's or autoimmune diseases. That is not true. Um, so first of all, Sjogren's patients, not all of them have blood tests positive. So around... 60 to 80 percent are anti-SSA antibody positive. I think that 80 percent is the more likely number in this situation. So 20 percent are serologically negative. The ANA is positive in up to 85 percent of individuals, but that means 15 percent won't have a positive ANA. And I'll see patients with a negative ANA and a positive anti-SSA antibody. Um, so that happens. Um, and so if you're truly asking the question, do they have Sjogren's, you do have to get the dedicated testing for that. And then around half will have a positive rheumatoid factor. The other tips I'll get if somebody has Sjogren's and like they have a negative SSA or an ANA is if they have low complement, they can have hypergammaglobulinemia or cryos present, I'll become more suspicious for the disease. And sometimes they're seronegative just because they have um, aminoglobulin deficiency. So then what do we do if blood tests are negative? We do a minor salivary gland biopsy. And again, we do these in clinic. They're really easy to do. Um, so you can see that we have all these little minor salivary glands. We do a tiny incision, and they just pop out, and we pluck out a few with forceps. Um, so it's not very difficult at all. And that lets us give a definitive diagnosis. And we know that when and it's pretty small, it's pretty small. Uh, and it's easy to do. Uh, so we do know um, that, that if this is abnormal, if the minor salivary gland is abnormal, then it's highly specific. And it used to be, and there's a very, the, the trick to the minor salivary gland, if somebody comes in and says they have a diagnosis, is that how the pathologist reads it is highly variable, as in like 50% variability. So one of the things we did first is work with the pathology department when I came here to sort out how we grade these neuropathologists are now grading them appropriately. And this is what they're looking at. So remember that foci we showed you before? Again, this is also simple. We calculate this thing called a focus score, where we look at the number of foci, and they have to be surrounded by normal tissue. And we just count them. We divide by the surface area and multiply that by four. And that's a focus score. And a focus score greater than or equal to one is considered diagnostic of Sjogren's in the appropriate context, which most people will say they do have it in that situation. I also do ultrasound of the gland. So this is your prodigal gland. So these are the ones that live in front of your ear. And you can just pop that ultrasound on. And what you can see on the right-hand side is a normal salivary gland, which is nice and homogeneous. And the product is, is kind of this grayish color because it has a lot of fat in it, too. Um, but on the, the left-hand side, what you see is a Sjogren's uh, product gland. And I don't know if with this lighting you can see it all that well, but you can see these dark hypoechoic areas. And those are cysts. 
I actually don't know what they're composed of, um, 100%. Um, but you'll see all these cysts, almost like their gland looks like Swiss cheese. And then they have these hyperechoic areas as well, or hyperechoic lines, I mean to say. And that can be done in clinic too. We're not 100% sure how to use ultrasounds yet. I personally don't find them too helpful. So how do we diagnose a Sjogren's patient? We diagnose them if they have either a positive antibody or an abnormal salivary gland biopsy. That makes sense because we should be able to confirm that they have an autoimmune disease, not just dryness. So they need to show us that they have something autoimmune. Now, this is criteria. So right, if I have a patient who has cryos or has low complement, clearly I would be suspicious and make a diagnosis. I wouldn't necessarily stick to the criteria, but I think this is a good general guideline. Um, and then they need to show dryness. But again, my young patients actually aren't as dry as my older patients. And so if they're young, they may not have this dryness. So if they have a positive antibody and other, the other manifestations of disease, certainly classification criteria are good for studies, but not clinical practice. Other things can cause dryness. I always check for HIV and hep C. So how do we treat Sjogren's syndrome? And this is my last general Sjogren's slide before we move on to something more specific to you. We have no FDA-approved therapies, none. Um, so right now, we just treat symptomatically. Um, we do have many clinical trials going on right now, um, of which hopefully we'll, we'll be a site for. Um, but, but right now, there's no approved treatment for the disease. So this is very hard for our patients um, because we largely counsel on how to treat the symptoms. So let's move on to manifestations that are potentially more specific to your field of interest. Um, so I made this chart based on a few small cohorts and case series. There really isn't much published on gynecologic manifestations of Sjogren's, despite how common this disease is in the autoimmune world. Um, so I made this just composite table with these various gynecologic manifestations of Sjogren's, and I bolded the things that were significant in those various studies compared to their uh, respective control populations. And the cohorts included from 30 to 50 Sjogren's patients, so you can see, again, very small. But one of the most prominent things they found is that vaginal dryness is extremely, is much more common in Sjogren's compared to non-Sjogren's in both pre- and post-menopausal females. So I think that it's pretty atypical for a third of folks walking the clinic who are premenopausal to discuss vaginal dryness. But in Sjogren's patients, it's a big problem. Dyspareunia, endometriosis, and hysterectomy in these small studies were found to be more common in Sjogren's and non-Sjogren's, same with menorrhagia and metorrhagia. They didn't see any difference in oophorectomy, age of menarche, or age of menopause. I thought this was somewhat interesting, but I had access to a big data set, right? So I had access to that data set, if you remember, of over 1,000 Sjogren's and 1,000 control subjects. But I should mention at this point that one of the weaknesses of this study is that my control weren't normal controls, right? So these are SICA controls. So they're patients who referred to this giant repository because they could have Sjogren's for some reason. So a lot of them, the majority had dryness. So they were referred to be, to be evaluated for Sjogren's because they had some dryness. I think that actually kind of strengthens these results because it reduces our power to detect a difference, um, to have a, pop a control population that's more similar. Um, but even with that, what we found, and I think this is interesting, is that Sjogren's patients tend to have a later onset of menarche, just a little bit, but enough where it's of interest. Um, they had the same number of pregnancies. They had a lower rate of exogenous hormone use. This is another weakness because you say, well, what hormone use? didn't say in the survey. They said, do you use female hormones, period. So that's what we had to work with. <laughs> um, but that's part of, you know, this will be the next step. We do a new study to sort this out. Um, and then they also had lower rates of hysterectomy. Um, menopause time was the same. We also looked at rates of miscarriage um, and full-term uh, deliveries, and they were the same between both populations. Um, again, this is a survey, so there could be re recall bias or something along those lines. Um, all the usual limitations of a, of a case control survey study. So what's going on? What's causing this vaginal dryness? And again, there's so little. So I'll talk through both of these. So this um, was a study that was done in the 1990s. 
and they did uh, vaginal biopsies and they found these perivascular lymphocytic infiltrates. And so they said, well, we think it's inflammatory. And then for the past three years, every year there's a group from the Netherlands who present the same poster at our conferences. And every year I'm interested, and I keep waiting for it to be published, and it hasn't been yet. But this is from their abstract that is online, and you can find. It is still not published. Um, they did uh, five, I believe, vaginal and endocervical biopsies and stained the slides, and they found this uh, dense uh, dermal uh, CD45 positive infiltrate. And then they keep mentioning at their poster their plan is to elucidate these populations further, I have yet to see that, um, but but so so I think what these tell us is it's very likely that a similar thing is going on in the vaginal mucosa that's going on in the oral mucosa, and in the lacrimal glands, right? That would make sense, but I think that this is a wide open field for further research. So knowing what's go what's going on, how do we address it? We do not use any immunomodulatory agents this time even though we think that this is an inflammatory process. And to me, that's mind-boggling, but it means that the field is wide open for research. That's great. OK, so how do we treat it then? So this is an image. I have a, a product directory from the Sjogren's Foundation in my office, and it just gives a vast amount of resources to my patients. And this is available online as well. Um, so we want to rule out other causes of dryness, right? And we do that for oral involvement as well. We look for other things that can, can exacerbate the dryness. So you can look for atrophic vaginitis, lichen sclerosis, and then I offer symptomatic therapy. And many of my patients are interested in the organic therapies at this point, so I included uh, this for your reference as well. Um, topically, you can use sunflower oils, vitamin E or aloe vera mixtures, and they do make other topical moisturizing agents, and I refer my patients to try this as well. And then, of course, we discuss counseling about lubrication during intercourse. And all this is available both at Sjogren's Foundation, um, and then also I did build a website through UW, and we just it just quickly has a subsection on vaginal dryness and how we treat it. Um, so you can also refer patients to that website if it's easier, because I think you do actually have to join the Sjogren's Foundation to get their resources. Um, so let's move on to maternal fetal complications. So this study was just performed in 2019. So it's a relatively recent study, which I think makes it of interest. Uh, and what they did is they had a national database. And they used ICD-9 codes to identify Sjogren's versus non-Sjogren's patients and to make their odds ratios. Now, the problem with that is that actually, until just last year, coding didn't differentiate between dryness and Sjogren's. Um, it just was Sicka syndrome, which was used for dryness as well, um, which just recently was changed in the ICD-10. Um, but what you can see here is that there's increased rates of preeclampsia, premature rupture of membranes, venous thromboembolism, IEGR, and congenital malformation in Sjogren's compared to control. And again, I think that the fact that they used just that ICD-9 code and they still found this difference indicates there's probably something really there because it would be less discriminatory to use that coding than to diagnose, I think, a true Sjogren's patient. The other problem with identifying ICD-9 codes like Sicka syndrome is that would also encompass other secondary Sjogren's, right? There's no way to differentiate. Um, like a rheumatologist would just code Sicka syndrome if they have overlapping Sjogren's. And so this also could include lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. And in lupus patients, we know that these are issues. That's not, that's not uh, news for us. So I think this is of interest, but um, further studies would be more beneficial. And then the thing we're all concerned about in the Sjogren's patients is neonatal lupus. So most of my patients are 50 to 60 year old Caucasian females, um, just based on the epidemiology of the disease. But I do have female, younger patients who want to get pregnant. And I usually will refer to maternal fetal medicine here. Of course, I always do, actually, to have this discussion. Um, because we do know about this risk. And most of the time, neonatal lupus, as we know, manifests as a rash, sometimes transaminitis, cytopenias, or CNS manifestations. Um, but what I'll focus on, because I think the data are uh, the least clear, is uh, congenital heart block um, manifestations and diagnosis. Oh, my arrow. OK. So um, we know that congenital heart block occurs in 1 to 2% of the general pop of the SSA antibody positive population. 
And there are some data showing that, it, that risk correlates with SSA antibody titers. Do you think in your clinical practice, if somebody had a low titer anti-SSA antibody, you wouldn't monitor them? Probably not. Furthermore, we know that ELISA's or the method whichever uh, hospital uses to detect anti-SSA antibody varies. And so I don't think that's the most reliable metric in clinical practice. There's around a 20% in utero mortality rate. And, this, uh, and you can see endocardial fibroelastosis, high drops, early, in, early onset congenital heart block, and lower ventricular rate. And those indicate a higher risk of mortality. Now, if you have endocardial fibroelastosis or a dilated cardiomyopathy, then your risk of mortality increases to 50%. And if you have both, it's a mortality of about 100%. Ten-year survival is around 86%. So this is clearly something that we consider in patients who have positive anti-SSA antibody. But who do we screen for? Because it, it isn't recommended, and I think appropriately so, that we screen everybody. But we know, if we just look at a pool of blood from random donors, that around 0.9% of them, or almost 1%, will have anti-SSA antibodies just in the general population. And if we swing back to our epidemiology, we remember that Sjogren's isn't going to usually reveal itself until they're way past their childbearing years. So they're usually not going to have this diagnosis when they walk into a clinic saying that they're pregnant. right? You, it, so, so it can be tricky. Now, if they do walk into the clinic saying they have an autoimmune disease, it makes things a little bit easier, right? So we screen patients who have Sjogren's syndrome, who have lupus, who have rheumatoid arthritis, or have this thing we put in our nose called undifferentiated connective tissue disease. Does anybody actually know what that is? I feel like nobody ever does. We don't even know either, really. It just means that somebody smells like they have autoimmune disease and we want to watch them, but they don't fit into any box. Um, and remember, autoimmune diseases are funny, right? Because they don't really, they overlap with each other, they have features of each other, they don't like to fit in boxes. And mixed connective tissue disease, which is a very well-defined entity where they have a positive RNP in a body, and they have Raynaud's and clear features of scleroderma, lupus, and a myositis um, overlapped. So those patients will scream. If we have um, a neonate with heart block without a structural cause, young infants who have had heart block, or a baby who had neonatal lupus, you know, that mom we're going to screen in the future as well. So this, um, you know, the literature here are a little bit soft, so I'll walk through it as best I can. So, you know, what's recommended are weekly pulsed Doppler fetal echocardiography studies. And the range on this varies. So the, I gave the most conservative range from 16 to 28 weeks of gestation. But many guidelines say I think 18 to 26 weeks is adequate for this. Um, and, and I think pe different people have different practices, and I'll go through one of the guidelines um, that we use as, or look at as rheumatologists. And then um, home monitoring for fetal heart rhythm um, is something that also is generally recommended. And the reason is because these autoantibodies are floating around, and within 24 hours you can get heart block, right? So doing a weekly echo isn't necessarily going to catch that abnormal rhythm. And so this was studied in a cohort of 273 SSA antibody positive Sjogren's patients. Actually, they may not have had clinical Sjogren's, SSA antibody positive people. And in that cohort, 21 moms flagged abnormal rhythms. And of those three did have congenital heart block. One was treated right away and reversed, and the rest persisted. So what's going on before we get onto the treatment? And I really liked these figures when I found them. Um, so this uh, figure here shows adult cardiomyocyte with anti-SSA antibodies kind of attacking those calcium ion channels. And we, we think that the anti-SSA antibodies are attacking the calcium ion channels, and then you get abnormal conduction, and then subsequently you get apoptosis. What lives inside an apoptotic cell? Anti-SSA antibodies. And so those anti-SSA antibodies are exposed. And again, this theme of a self-perpetuating problem. Um, now, so in the fetal tissue, we already know that fetal cardiomyocytes have increased rates of apoptosis naturally. So they are predisposed by this one phenomenon. And so they undergo apoptosis. They reveal these epitopes, and you get anti-SSA antibodies. Um, and then that further propagates the issue because then um, the cardiomyocytes apoptose, 
and you get this cycle. Well, so we know about the apoptosis component of this, but why are fetal cardiomyocytes more predisposed to this than adult cardiomyocytes? There are two other theories. So those involve the calcium um, ion channels and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which in fetal cardiomyocytes are much sparser. Um, so by being more sparse, we hypothesize they're more susceptible to insult compared to adult cardiomyocytes, which have a dense um, calcium um, ion channel and they have more dense sarcoplasmic reticulum as well. So how do we treat this? So you all, I presume, know about, you know about the hydroxychloroquine study. So this, right, this is what we use. And this is, um, most of my patients are on this before they want to get pregnant. Um, but this was based on this study. And I think that this is one of the more well-done studies. So they looked at 40 SSA antibody positive patients who were, who were on hydroxychloroquine and compared them to 217 patients who were not on hydroxychloroquine. And then they looked at outcomes. Within the hydroxychloroquine group, 7.5% had cardiac um, congenital heart block. And in the unexposed percent, 21.2% did. And even more compelling, in the exposed group, there were no deaths, whereas in the unexposed group, there was a 21.7% rate of mortality. So I'm mean, just looking at those numbers, that's convincing, unlike many of the other studies we've reviewed as well. And that leads to an odds ratio of 0.2. And you can see that confidence interval does not cross one. So it's believable. Um, and so this supports the use of hydroxychloroquine. I would like to say now the only really evidence-based medicine use of hydroxychloroquine that I have now, because we don't use it to treat children as a standard rule anymore based on um, studies. So then there's also fluorinated steroids. And I created this table. And I had some formatting questions problems, but this was due, so I just put it in. Um, and what we have is we have, uh, in this column, I put the treated patients for each of these studies and the untreated patients here, and then looked at the primary outcome that the, the cohort was used to look at. And so here we have 21 patients who are treated and 16 who are untreated. And this is really the study, I think, that shot um, fluorinated steroid use in, into use, 90% um, versus 46% survival. Um, with a significant p-value, which gets everybody excited. Uh, but this study had a really big problem, and that the untreated cohort was a historical cohort. So it was before the treated cohort, which all of them were later. So we know that there's a clear confounder there as to why their mortality may have improved. Um, so this is the most compelling reason to use learning studies that we have in literature, I think. Um, and subsequent studies haven't been as convincing. Um, so this is the largest study with 71 treated, 85% untreated, and they presented hazard ratios of progression and mortality. And there really wasn't any difference. Those confidence intervals surround one quite nicely, so we can't really see much support there. And this study of 42 untreated and 14 treated didn't find much of a difference in AV block, survival, or rates of dilated cardiomyopathy. And these are treated versus untreated. Um, but interestingly, they did bring up this, this difference that they found, that patients who were treated with fluorinated steroids had higher rates of um, in utero growth restriction. So begging the question of, could we potentially be doing harm? Which is, this is, this is our persistent question in any sort of medical practice, right? Weighing our risks and our benefits um, and trying to even understand them. And then lastly, this study didn't show any difference between the groups. The next thing we have to use is IVIG. And based on the pathogenesis, I think IVIG along with plasma exchange makes sense, right? We think it's an autoantibody mediated disease. So if anything, this, this makes sense pathogenically. Um, but there really isn't much data to support it. And again, this is, I think, a problem that you see more often in your literature than I'm used to seeing. It's just a problem um, that we do the best we can with. So in this study of 20 patients who had congenital heart block, 80% were alive after using IVIG. And in this recent study, um, they looked at 88 pregnancies in SSA antibody patients. And they actually, it was a retrospective study, but they just listed, which is nice, all the different therapies that they used, including hydroxychloroquine, DMARDs, fluorinated steroids, IVIG, and plasma exchange. And they didn't see any differences. But again, this was a smaller study and retrospective. Um, but, th but it is in use. Um, and I think that many people use it in their clinical practice. 
So this was recently published in the rheumatology literature. Um, and they, I thought they did a really nice job of making a flow chart. And what it does is it flow charts what currently expert guidelines posit as how we should be treating congenital heart block. And as you can see, you know, hydroxychloroquine remains at the top of our preventative list. Um, and then it kind of walks through the degree of heart block and what we can consider trying um, to, to ameliorate the risk um, posed to these uh, patients. So with that, I would like to give a little plug for my showrooms clinic. Um, you know, as we discussed, I don't provide unique treatment. Hopefully, we'll be performing clinical trials. But we do have a lot of interesting research opportunities for our patients to participate in. Um, and many of them feel like by actively participating in the process, that they actually are making their disease better. And they feel more proactive about it. Um, so in conclusion, I reviewed primary Sjogren's syndrome in general and the fact that we can recognize this in the clinic. And I always beg to the frontline providers, you know, think about this or at least have it on your radar because you are very well could be the first person to recognize this if a patient brings up this issue. And now at least you know there are those six quick questions you can ask, ask the patient, those validated questions. Um, we discussed gynecologic manifestations and the use of symptomatic treatment to ameliorate those symptoms. And we discussed the obstetric manifestations and reviewed the literature to date that we know of. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your time. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you all. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent talk. I'm sure we have some questions from the audience. Otherwise, I, um, I have one. Maybe I'll start, and then I'll walk over to you, Antonio. Um, what do you think about sort of rescreening for SSA and SSB antibodies, you know, either before pregnancy or early in pregnancy, either if they were previously negative, rate of turning positive, or vice versa? If they were previously positive, I don't think there's any utility in rescreening. I think you should treat them as if they're positive. We know that the rate of seroconverting is less than 10%. Um, I would only rescreen before pregnancy if they had one of those autoimmune diseases or one of the other. And then I think it's reasonable because patients do seroconvert. And we also know that that time period is when they tend to become autoantibody positive. Um, and again, I, like I said, I wouldn't pay much attention to titers because that's highly variable. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering how much these will overlap with um, you know, the fact that if the onset after menopause is very common, we often see patients in the clinic for um, for urge urinary incontinence, and sometimes I wonder if this can be like side effect of side effect of dry mouth and increased water intake that onsets her urinary incontinence, or the other way, um, like farther down the treatment uh, of these patients when we do antimuscarinic that yes. dry mouth, or how much you know maybe patients with like starting shoulders would be tolerate the treatment much less. So that's actually a really good point. And even rheumatologists don't recognize this. So to answer the second part of your question first, so pilocarpine and sevimaline, which as we know have been around for more than a century, at least the pilocarpine has. Um, one of the si adverse effects is uh, urinary incontinence and increased urgency. Um, but many rheumatologists don't know that. So I've been called out. Actually, a gynecologist called me. Could this happen? And I said, absolutely, it could happen. Um, so yes, that's a problem, and it should be counseled ahead of time so patients don't end up having to go through the rigmarole and we just discontinue therapy, or at least try changing because pilocarpine is a higher rate of side effects than civimaline, and otherwise they work the same, so even a simple change in therapy could be tried. And the alternative of, you know, they end up having these, you're seeing them because they're getting dry, I think that that's an, that is an opportunity to intervene. Because if we do diagnose them at that time, if they really have severe dryness and you just walk through questions, like how dry do you have to swallow water to, to eat a cracker? Or even you know, do you have to wake up at night to sip water is something I'll ask people. Um, then you can identify the problem and we can use wetting agents or the silagogues so that they're not drinking so much water. And we even have patients who become very hyponatremic because they drink so much water, um, even with normal kidneys otherwise. Um, so, so that's a good point, and that again shows the importance of why I came to talk today, so that you can be the front line of recognition and we can ameliorate some of those symptoms. Very, very exciting talk, Sarah. So quick question. Um, 
with the finding, at least from that, um, was it the Karolinska group that uh, showed in, uh, immune infiltrations in the vaginal mucosa, um, is Shorkin's associated with infiltrations in other mucosal tissues, especially, um, you know, the one thing that I care about is endometrium, and yeah. certainly if there is a um, an increased incidence of IOGR and increased incidence of preeclampsia, one wonders whether sort of autoimmune biases there could be affecting decidualization and development of a normal placenta. So yes, it does affect other mucosal tissues, right? So we know it affects oral mucosal tissues, um, and um, we know that around, well, the eye is a little bit trickier, but I don't know anybody who's looked at it. And I think it's certainly a reasonable hypothesis um, and should be looked into. Um, we also know, too, I should mention, have mentioned this with the uh, urinary urgency. So Sjogren's can be associated with an interstitial uh, cystitis. And actually, when they biopsy that, it's an immune infiltrate there, too. Um, but usually, we don't treat with immunosuppressive agents. We treat symptomatically, which doesn't make sense. But the treatment of the disease doesn't make sense to me. So, so no one has done endometrial biopsies? On Nobody. Sjogren's. No. So I have your patient. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other questions? So there are. And so specifically, you know, when I think about, because we do have dryness and we get sometimes um, thickened saliva and mucosa, um, and the pulmonary findings, we can get lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis, which, are, um, which ends up being sort of a cystic lung disease. Um, but I think because cystic fibrosis is so heavily genetically linked, um, people haven't really looked much more into the relationship. Um, but certainly the secretions aspect of it um, is similar. Would, would that address your question? Yeah. yeah. That's really, I actually never thought about it that way, and I think that that's another advantage of speaking to people of different interests and experience, because I think that would be something really interesting to look into. Awesome. Any last questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.